As we are in the midst today of College Awareness Month, we highlight several stories from the field that lift up our practice and is multifold throughout our district, while we also pilot opportunities that are considered for growth. As you heard boldly, we do this now, as in the words of Martin Luther King, with a fierce urgency of now. Today, our opening speaker will be Dr. Tyrone Howard. I'd like to share with you a little bit of some of the things you might find in his research and practice and what have esteemed colleagues across the nation have said about them. From his book, Why Race and Culture Matters in Schools, Closing the Achievement Gap in America's Classrooms, it states explanations for disparities in the academic achievement of low-income minority and mainstream students have a long, complex, and contested history in the United States as well in other nations. James Banks says that Howard points out one of the most sophisticated and nuanced discussions I have read on the role of culture in learning cultural difference explanations. If they are not mediated by a deep understanding of the ways in which the cultures are fluid, changing, multifaceted, contextualized, and complex, can lead to stereotypical thinking about cultures and the essentialization of the cultures of students from diverse groups. He states further that Howard thinks that it is essential but not sufficient for teachers to acquire a sophisticated and deep understanding of culture and its teaching implications. The paramount goal of Dr. Howard's project is to complicate, to complicate and deepen educators' understanding of culture and its implications for closing the achievement gap. Further, Geneva Gay, another well-renowned expert in this field, says this about Dr. Howard that he is astute enough to realize that the demands of the instructional complexities of racial and cultural diversity are likely to intimidate some educators. So he responds by providing actual examples of how educators can do the work instead of telling educators what they should be doing. His candor, his model of motivation that we can all emulate is part of the LA Unified family. Dr. Howard's work resonates with our leaders and the many lives of our educators that he has influenced. He has become a thought partner with us, leading our preschool through 16 relationship that has impacted our strategic thinking, supported the facilitation of the mayor's college promise, and has received many standing ovations at our principal organization meetings. From classrooms at Cleveland High School to the courageous conversations about race, to incubating the intersection of research and practice at our own LAUSD UCLA Community School, it is my honor my honor to welcome a scholar who boldly underscores not only do the lives of young people depend on our work as transformative educators, but so do all of our collective fates. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tyrone Howard. Boy, with that introduction, that's a hard act to follow. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you, esteemed uh, board members and committee members for uh, having me here with you uh, this morning. I want to um, take the time out to, to really talk about not only the work that I've done briefly, but more importantly, how the work that I've done can be done in conjunction with this district in a way that I think can be helpful and that can be transformative. And I always preface my comments as I talk about this work because it, it's really steeped in my own set of experiences. Uh, I, I stand here as someone who is uh, really deeply humbled by the fact that I am even able to do this because in many ways where I grew up in Compton, California, young boys who look like me who came from my experience don't get this opportunity. So I am forever indebted for those educators who saw something in me that I did not see in myself. Uh, those educators who were committed, who were concerned, and who cared deeply enough to talk about what possibilities could be presented that would allow me to graduate from high school, uh, go on to college, and then subsequently go on to earn other degrees and accolades of that sort. So I'm committed first and foremost to helping children. And I think anything else that we do short of that, we should be asking ourselves, why are we spending our time doing it? And so what I'd like to talk about with you today are just a few things that I think I, and the group that I work with, can be helpful with as we think about how we move the district forward, how we do everything within our powers to ensure that every student that is a part of this district uh, receives every opportunity to be successful academically, socially, emotionally, and culturally. Um, with that being said, what I'd like to do is talk about the fact that as we start this conversation, I want us to, to be mindful, and I know everyone here on this committee understands this, but that not all is doom and gloom in our district here. And I think if you hear some of the, the pundits and the naysayers, they will tell you that we're going to hell in a handbasket, but that's just not the case here. If you look at some of the data that we see across the board, it tells us that some things are moving in the direction that we would like to see them move in. The fact that you've got three-quarters of the students in this district uh, are 
estimated to graduate this year. That is important. That is notable because there are other larger districts who would love to have those numbers. And so I think we have to take some, some comfort in knowing that we are moving in the direction that we know is important to move. Uh, we also see that, you know, almost half of students are, are, are completing A through G requirements with the C or better. If you looked at those numbers about a decade ago, they were about half that number. So many of the steps that this board and this committee and others around the district have been committed to have been moving us in the right direction to ensure that all students have college as a real and viable opportunity uh, as they leave high schools across this district. We also know that uh, we have an increasing number of schools that are now participating in the ELLP program where we're seeing the importance of literacy, language, uh, and helping ensure that students have everything that they need in order to develop the literacy skills to help them be successful uh, across the board. So these are all things that we have to continue to talk about as we talk about what's happening with this district. And so part of what I've been pleased to hear uh, Superintendent King talk about is that we have to tell our narrative and part of what I think we've got to all do a better job of is promoting those things that are moving uh, in a positive direction in the district because there are lots of things that we can brag about, lots of things we should be proud of, lots of things that we should be promoting on an ongoing basis because this is hard work, it's deeply seated work, but there are some things that we have to tell our stories about. And the problem is if we don't tell our story, we are then left with others telling our story. And when others tell our story, we know they don't always tell the story in the most comprehensive and accurate format. So I think we've got to be willing to talk about what is working, what is moving right in the district. So while we applaud those things that are going well, I think we can't be too naive about the fact that there are still some challenges that we have to contend with. And those challenges everyone here knows about and everyone is, is, is clearly aware of them, that we have to be frank and we have to be honest and we have to be thoughtful about the fact that we know that African American and Latino students still lag significantly behind their peers from other ethnic and racial groups. That is not a secret, uh, that is nothing new, uh, but it continues to happen. And I think the more we put resources the more we are able to be honest and thoughtful and sustained about why that is, what are some of the, the deeply seated factors that explain that, and how do we begin to disrupt that and challenge that, I think we'll be much better off. We also know that we struggle with some of the challenges that other districts across this country struggle with. It's the fact that low-income students in this district continue to underperform. I am one, like I'm sure everyone on this committee believes, that low-income students do not have to be destined to failure because if that were the case, I would not be standing before you here right now. And I'm willing to bet that many of you on this committee would not be here as well. But we've got to dismantle this belief and this thinking that poor kids cannot succeed. Also, we have to still find ways to help our EL students perform better. Uh, EL students are going, to be con are going to continue to be a big part of our district. This is not a small population. It's a growing population, and we've got to embrace it. We've got to find ways to support those students because they, like any other students across this district, deserve 100% of our efforts. And then finally, um, you all know this, we spend lots of money, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on special education. We've got to ask ourselves, why is that? I think we have to understand that there are students who are deeply in need of special education services, but I have done research, and many of you are, are familiar with this research, that shows that we continue to mis, how should I say this nicely? We continue to mischaracterize students for special education services when they're not actually in need of special education services, but there are other challenges that are going on, which I'll talk about briefly. So those are some of the challenges that persist, and I want to talk about at least four issues that I think we can use in partnership to begin to address them. Now, I'm also aware of the fact that these are complex, deep-seated problems, and there are no simple solutions. There are no easy answers. And what I want to share with you are just a couple of approaches that I'm sure everyone here has thought about, but I want to reinforce and reiterate why we have to address at least these four areas if we're going to be able to keep the district moving in the right direction. Uh, so I want to focus on four areas. I want to talk about the importance for us to examine race in a much more honest and thoughtful and sustained manner because I think that's something that we have to do if we're serious about helping to dismantle these gaps. Then I want to talk about literacy. I want to talk about the, the salience of trauma. And then I want to talk about the importance of college and career readiness. So I want to use those four areas as points of departure as to how we can begin to respond to some of the challenges that we have in this district. Let's start off with issues around race. And this is the, the, the big conversation. It's the big pink elephant in the room that we don't want to talk about. We look around, we look over, but until we look at it and tackle it for what it is, we'll continue to find ourselves facing an uphill battle. There has been study after study after study after study that shows that students from certain racial and ethnic backgrounds continue to be looked at through a lens of deficit-oriented uh, perspectives from teachers, from principals, from administrators, uh, that can no longer exist. Uh, again, study after study that has shown how bias is real, it shows that discrimination is, ra is rampant. Uh, we don't want to talk about race because we're uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about race because we're oftentimes 
scared. We don't want to talk about race because oftentimes it's not the politically correct thing to do. But when it comes to educating our students who come from a host of ethnic and racial backgrounds, if we don't talk about race, we are missing one of the biggest aspects of who they are as young people. And I don't want to bore you with a whole lot of details, but I can tell you when I talk about implicit bias that exists in our schools, part of what we have to recognize is that this is an ideology that persists across all ethnic and racial backgrounds. We oftentimes engage in this process as if this is something that only white teachers do towards students of color. That is not the case. When we talk about an ideology, we're talking about teachers of color who oftentimes have these same implicit biases towards students of color. So what we've got to do is more of what I've been part of at Cleveland High School where there's courageous conversations where principals and teachers have these real hard conversations about race and what it means and where these ideas come from and what that means in the classroom. Lots of students that we talk to feel like they walk in the classrooms and they already have two strikes against them because teachers see them through this jaded lens that tells them because they're black or because they're brown, they cannot succeed. Until we have that conversation, until we have ongoing and sustained professional development to help every teacher, every administrator, every staff member think long and hard about racial attitudes and racial bias, we will continue to see black and Latino students struggling to have the kinds of opportunities that they deserve. So I think we have to tackle it from that standpoint, but I think we can also complement it with the work we're doing with the ethnic studies curriculum. Ethnic studies is important because it helps our students see themselves reflected in what they learn. There's been tons of research that shows that culture and race matters, and when students learn about their own histories, backgrounds, cultures, and perspectives, they are much more engaged. Their levels of, levels of effort increase, and then their outcomes subsequently improve. So we've got to have this conversation. Uh, it is long past due. Uh, we, are a racially, we are one of the most racially diverse cities in the world. And for us not to be willing to have this conversation on behalf of our students would be irresponsible. And I think we've got the momentum. I think we've got the will. I think it's time to start having those conversations. And I think the sooner we start this process, the better for our students. The second part I want to talk about is trauma. Uh, and I raise this because I spend a lot of time in classrooms. Uh, and part of what I continue to see and hear from teachers and administrators is that there are challenges that our students are facing that seemingly are beyond the level of training that many teachers have. And the more I began to observe and listen and, and hear what teachers and what administrators were saying is that we have lots of students who have trauma that is untreated and it is deeply seated. And we have data that shows there was an article that came out in the Los Angeles Times just a few weeks ago that talked about there were over but 90% of students in this district that had been a part of some kind of traumatic stress in the past couple of years, this is an issue that we have got to pull the scab off of and look at it for what it entails because it is hurting lots of students. And we know that students who suffer from trauma in different ways, uh, we have cognitive psychologists who have told us that trauma has a profound impact on physiological development, cognitive development, psychosocial development, social emotional development. So if we're not willing to understand the impacts of poverty, the impacts of neglect, the impacts of violence, uh, the impacts of bullying, displacement. We have a, a large number of students who are in foster care across this district, and many of those students are not receiving the kind of psychological support services that they need. Trauma is a real issue. Uh, yesterday was World Mental Health Day. I think we have to have conversations about mental health uh, in this country, and we have to have them about our young people. Uh, and I'm also deeply concerned because I think in many communities of color, we don't talk about mental health issues. We say folks should just pray about it. We say folks should just meditate about it. Well, that can be fine, but in some cases, we need sig significant types of psychological services. And I think when you have higher levels of poverty, I think there needs to be more intense focus on the effects of trauma on learning. Uh, we can talk about all the programs, all the curriculum, all the instructional interventions that we can come up with, but until we deal with the ways in which many of our students are in deep-seated pain, they are suffering, they are hurting, and they are not sure how to express their pain. They're not sure how to express their frustration. They're not sure how to express their anger. It is having a profound impact on their outcomes. So we have to talk about trauma. Uh, I am talking to teachers who say that I don't know what to do. I'm not sure how to respond. I don't know how to act because what I'm seeing in my classrooms are children who are acting out in some of the most misguided ways possible. That is not normal behavior. That's not typical behavior. Until we begin to take on trauma uh, across the board, Again, we're going to face an uphill battle and not reach that level of 100% graduation for all of our students. The third point I'd like to talk about is literacy. Uh, and I, I think that goes without saying that what we understand that this is, this is the key to not only educational success, it is the key to upper mobility, it is the key to having uh, what we might consider the self-fulfilling and self-actualized life. And we know that the sooner we can intervene on behalf of our young people, the better they will perform. And we've got Lots of research that we've done that shows that when we have early, intense intervention with literacy, 
we not only improve the literacy outcomes of our students, we improve the mathematical outcomes, we improve science outcomes, we, we improve social studies outcomes. There's even research that show that students do better with PE, physical education improves when literacy. Students feel better about themselves when they are literate. Students feel better about themselves when they are able to have a command of literacy in, in different ways. So we've got to put literacy at the forefront of what we're doing. No disrespect to any other subject areas, but this is the foundation. Literacy is the key. And part of what we know is that there are some real intricate links between literacy, language, and culture that cannot be disentangled. And so what we should not be asking our students to abandon their primary languages in their efforts to become literate citizens. We live in an information age, and we will help, we will help put our students behind the eight ball if we don't help them become literate citizens at a time when information is at everyone's fingertips. So we've got to have a focus that is sustained and that's, in, that's intense on literacy. You know, I can say this. There is nothing more painful to walk into a high school classroom, and I've done this in the last couple of weeks, and to look at young 16, 17, sometimes 18-year-old students who are about to send off into the world to compete for jobs, to compete for college applications, and to see these young people struggle with some of the most basic of texts. And when that happens, and we see 17, 18-year-old students who read at fifth, sixth, seventh grade levels, we should all take some, 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 some some criticism for that because we're all part of that, that failure. We have failed those young people uh, and that cannot be the norm anymore. We have to see how we can intervene at earlier stages of this process to ensure that each and every student does not leave elementary school without the, 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 the skills and the tools to become uh, literate in a much more uh, functional and, and critical manner. So I am one who talks about this and I will continue to talk about this to I'm blue in the face. Whatever supports we can put in place for early sustained literacy inter intervention has to happen and it has to happen yesterday because that is so fundamental to academic success. And then the final point I want to touch upon, and I say this because I'm biased. Uh, I work at a college. I work at a university. Uh, I oftentimes engage students about where they've gone to school. Uh, and I want to know that they are from Los Angeles County. I want to know that they're from LAUSD. But when I see fewer and fewer students at times, it seems that come from LAUSD, that is not something that's good to hear. We've got to put this focus, and I'm glad that this is College Readiness Month, and I think this work has got to be a big part of what we do. High school graduation is one important step, but part of what I tell students is that this should not be your final graduation. We want to see subsequent graduation. We want to see graduations from college. I say multiple as in bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, graduate degrees, professional degrees. And so part of what we've got to do here is continue to articulate. There's a lot of misinformation in our high schools about what is required to become college ready. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation from our counselors about what they need to do to adequately prepare their students to become competitively eligible for Cal States, for, C for, uh, for UCs, as well as for private colleges across the country. Uh, and part of what we see is that despite the fact that we've seen increases in the number of students from low-income backgrounds and students of color into our universities, we still see certain groups that are woefully underrepresented, namely African-American and Latino students. They are 60% of the state's population, but only 25% of students in the UC. Uh, we should not be satisfied with that. And so part of what we have to do is be very explicit and forthright about what is it that we can do to help increase that pathway from high school to college. College should be the norm for all of our students. That does not happen accidentally. That does not happen by, by, by happenstance. That means that we have to say, what is it that college want and, want and need? And what is it that the high schools and, and, and middle schools and elementary schools need? I'm deeply concerned, too. And let me put this on the table. Uh, I don't want to go too political, but I think this one deserves our political attention. We have to support and hope that Proposition 55 passes. Because if Proposition 55 does not pass, what typically happens is that universities such as the one where I work at take huge cuts. When those cuts happen, what we typically do is we go outside of the state and we go outside of this nation to find students who then become to begin to make up the gaps in the, in the, in the financial uh, uh, areas. So when that happens, our students lose. When that happens, we see far fewer California students. When that happens, we see far fewer LAUSD students. So I'm going to vote yes for 55. I hope everyone else here votes yes for 55. But even if 55 passes, right, this still has to be an ongoing part of what we're doing. Uh, I've been working uh, with uh, the mayor's office with the College Promise. I think it's those kind of commitments that have to be a part of what we do. Uh, Dr. Gibson was part of that work, and, and I, I applaud the mayor's office, and I applaud this district for saying that we recognize that this does not happen by accident, that we have to say we are willing to put our, our money where our mouth is and put resources and ongoing sets of commitments to ensure that every student, regardless of his or her background, sees college as a viable opportunity to be successful. 
Again, I say that because I stand here before you as someone whose mother had a high school diploma from Manual Arts High School, and she was not fortunate enough to go to college, but she told her two boys that when you go to college, and she told that to us every single day, when you go to college, when you go to college. We got so sick and tired of hearing when we go to college, we just wanted to go so we could keep our mother's mouth shut, right? <laughs> but the idea was, the expectation was that is what we would do. And I think that has got to be the mindset, that must be the mentality, that must be the commitment that we make to all of our students, that when they go to college, they will be able to look back to the kinds of commitments that folks on this board, folks on this committee, folks in this district said that we believe that every student, regardless of his or her socioeconomic background, regardless of their racial or ethnic background, regardless of any of their racial, uh, religious uh, uh, affiliations, that they had every opportunity to make college a part of their reality. So I think with those four steps, we can start to make a move in the right direction. Uh, I am willing to be a part of this work with a, a team of folks that I work with. Dr. Nagar is part of the team that we work with, and uh, Dr. Nagar and I had dinner just two nights ago, and look, here's the bottom line. I've written a lot of books. I've written all kinds of articles, and I, I, if I don't write another thing from now until the time I die, I'm content with that. Now it's about how do you start making an impact on lives? How do you start making a real substantial influence in the way that young people experience schools? That's what this is all about now. How do we take everything within our fiber of our being to say that no child, and I mean no child, does not get written off because of circumstances that are beyond their control? I'm ready. Uh, this is work that I am I'm deeply committed to because I said this work is personal for me because I know that there were folks who invested in me, folks who saw the potential that I had even when I did not have it. And it is that with that sense of urgency, is with that level of intensity that I am prepared to work in partnership with this district to ensure that we get it on the move and do the things that we can do to ensure the, the success of each and every student. I thank you for your time. I hope I have not blown too much wind your way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, board members, uh, do we have any questions? I, I know I want to make a statement. I, I, I feel the enthusiasm and the commitment here and uh, uh, some of the issues you brought up. I, I had one question. Yes, sir. And I, I, I want to ask. Uh, I saw or I, I took copious notes on your four issues. And uh, the one I, I wanted to ask, and it was the first one, huh? we must talk about uh, race. And, and be implicit, it must be implicit in our schools. Give me an example, because there are teachers watching right now. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Yes. So one example I'll use, I'll come back to what we did at Cleveland High School just last week. And what it looks like is, is having a conversation with staff about when we think about certain groups, what comes to mind? Like, let's just kind of just generate stereotypes that we hear about Asian Americans. African Americans, Latinos, whites, right? And in that process, you hear lots of stuff that teachers and people in general just hear all the time, right? And so we have to ask, what does that mean if those stereotypes are rampant and just our implicit ways of thinking and knowing, right? Because if you've got some negative perceptions around Latino students, around undocumented individuals, when you walk into that classroom, you can rest assured that that is not going to be in the best interest of that child. So what it meant was we had a two-hour session of teachers talking about sort of perceptions they have about X group, about Y group, and that came from the fact that when I grew up, my mother said these things about this group that weren't very becoming. And I know I have that there, and I've got to find ways to rid myself of that. And then going through a process of checking implicit bias and ridding oneself of those beliefs, because if anyone spent any time in this country, we're all affected by it in some way, shape, or form, right? So what it looks like is having these conversations, oftentimes they're uncomfortable, oftentimes they're emotional, they can become angry, but I think it's important for folks to talk about this stuff and say, where did I get it from? And to be reflective about why they have to be able to talk about these issues and try to begin to eradicate some of the ways that they might think about certain populations, because if they don't, they bring that stuff into the classroom. And students tell us all the time that I know that teacher doesn't see my potential in ways that she sees the potential in another student. So it's not just a one-time deal. We'll follow back up next month with a, uh, with a continuation of those conversations. Then we'll follow up two months later. So it's an ongoing set of conversations. We use Glenn Singleton's work around courageous conversations, very effective work in helping students, I mean, helping teachers to think, reflect, and act on some of their own racial prejudices and biases. I appreciate that because it goes back and reminds me of when we were working with teachers and we talked about the Pygmalion effect mm -hmm. and Rosenthal's theory Absolutely. of wait time and how you may not even be cognizant, but That's right. little Joe That's right. doesn't answer the question and you don't help him along, 
whereas Mary over here does, mm -hmm. and you say, great answer. Absolutely. So uh, Absolutely. Uh, I, I needed to hear what you were saying, and I, Absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank Other you so board much. members, you have questions? Mr. Zimmer. Dr. Howard, thank you. For, thank you. Uh, for being here, and, and thank you for, um, I want to thank you for the books. Mm -hmm. I know uh, you, you may not write another, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I hope you do. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and because it's affected um, uh, both my thinking and uh, I think it's affected um, uh, schools of education and, and teachers across the nation. So um, I thank you, and I thank you for um, being part of the changes that we're trying to make in this district. Um, you, um, your comments um, about um, uh, about race, and particularly one comment, um, when you reminded us that it's not only white teachers. I was reminded, and I know this is going to make some folks uncomfortable when I say this. Um, uh, Lawson Bush was my professor at Cal State, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he said something to me once that stopped me and just stopped me cold. And he said, "You know, um, a school can be ninety-eight percent Latino or African American, with eighty-five percent or ninety percent of the teachers Latino or African American, and mm -hmm. still be a white supremacist school." Absolutely. I agree. And uh, it just stopped me mm -hmm. and, 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 and totally mm -hmm. reset my thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think it reminds us how deep and intentional mm -hmm. deficit mindset mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and how pervasive it is. And I've, many of us, not just myself, have been talking about this and, 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 and trying to use whatever microphone that we have, whatever opportunity both in individual conversations and school-wide conversations and in larger conversations, um, I still don't think we've crossed the threshold. And, 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 I, and, and so I appreciate the work at, at Cleveland. I appreciate work that I know is going on on individual campuses across this mm -hmm. district. But if you were to suggest something to us, because we we don't we don't legislate hearts and minds, that's right. But but we do set direction. And what I mean, I so I used to think that this is all about the next generation of teachers. And if if and, and and we've supported and 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 some of us have pushed to we were blue in the face about these career ladder programs. Dr. V has Harbor Teacher Prep in in his district. I have a you know a program I'm very proud of in Hollywood High School. We have these, mm -hmm. and, and I used to think that it was all about if we could just have teachers from the community. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not sure that's all that it is either, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because. I do think that something happens in schools of education, frankly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in teacher training programs, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that that still reinforces yep. and reinforces yep. deficit mindset. Yep. Yep. So, yep. so from so your input to us in terms of if we could do one or a couple of things as a district right, to right. just to just say in. Every, you know, in 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 every thing that we do, that we are a, that we are going to be just as intentional mm -hmm, mm -hmm, about attacking mm -hmm. deficit mindset mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as those who have benefited from deficit mindset were intentional about setting up the systems that caused it. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I appreciate your your question, uh, Mr. Zimmer. I think that leadership is 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 key here, and while we know that teachers make the most profound impact at the classroom level. I think what we cannot um, overlook is the importance of what school leaders do and what school leaders say and how school leaders act and the tone that school leaders set. And so if there was one thing that would be a recommendation from me, I would say that if you took school leaders, and this is why it's been, it's been really powerful the last few months working with 
Dr. Gibson and, and Derek and, and the rest of the folks around school leadership is what would it look like if all school leaders had to engage in this process of really having some courageous conversations about race amongst themselves, right? Just to talk about how the deficit thinking uh, originates, where it comes from, how it affects us, uh, how it influences our own unconscious you know, ways of acting and thinking. If all, because I think many school leaders get this and understand this, but I don't think many know how to act on it. I don't think many know what to do about it. Um, you can talk to probably any host of school leaders who can say, yeah, I've got teachers who've got some really deficit-oriented types of, of, of thinking. I don't know what to say to them. I don't know how to help move them along because they themselves have not been equipped with the skills and the knowledge to do that. So I would start with leaders right first and foremost. And if there was some kind of policy that could be set forth that said leaders have to be responsible for engaging in this work and then once they engage in this work, they then begin to have it trickle down to their staffs, I think that would be a, a huge step in the right direction, right? Because what you might find is that lots of, of the leaders themselves subscribe to these deficit-oriented approaches to thinking about black and Latino students. And so it may shake the consciousness up in some of them to say, I've never thought about this in ways that perhaps I need to think about it. So I would start there. I think that's a big part. Then I think you begin to sort of you know, galvanize your individual staffs. You work with schools. Uh, you, work with, I mean, you work with staffs. You work with, with faculty. And it's not just faculty. It's also every staff member in those schools. It's the, it's, the, it's the support staff. It's the custodial crew. It's making sure that everyone, that's why school culture is so important. How do you build a, a healthy school culture where that everybody in the building, regardless of their classification, regardless of their title, is, has, has bought into this idea that I can make an impact on students' lives? A colleague of mine I wrote a book, uh, Kimberly Scott, about 10 years ago, uh, at a New Jersey high school, and she looked at who was it that students felt most comfortable talking to? Who did they trust most? It wasn't principals, it wasn't teachers, it was the support staff, it was the nurses, it was the secretaries, it was the, it was the custodial crew, because those individuals took the time out to engage them. They didn't judge them because they were poor. They didn't look down on them because they were in foster care. They didn't think twice about them in terms of their potential because they may not have had the, the ideal background. So if we can cultivate that kind of approach with everyone in the school building, I think that becomes a, a step in the right direction. So I would say two things, starting with leaders and then how we cultivate an entire school culture to begin to recognize the potential of what can happen for students who come from less than ideal backgrounds. Because as we all know here, look, there's a lot of potential, a lot of promise in these communities, but there are some folks who just have already written students off from, the, from, the, from day one, and that has to stop. Dr. McKenna. Thank you. First, uh, Dr. Howard, your, your um, teachings have always been very helpful, more than helpful and profound in many ways. I, I won't go into a long thing because we have a short time and we have a big agenda. But it reminds me of many things that have happened in my life around the issue of race and class. Mm -hmm. Kind of go together in terms of how people perceive other people. And I remember uh, Louis Farrakhan from the, uh, the Muslim nation said that he is he he boldly and proudly declares himself to be a racist because he studies race. Mm -hmm. He said, like a scientist, mm -hmm. an internist, mm -hmm. and a physicist, he mm -hmm. declares that to be the subject that he, so he's an ist, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, but then the issue of studying race and practicing racism is often a challenge for folks who will not say that I practice racism. I can I cannot guarantee you. I can pretty much say that if you ask a large group of people, even people who are in the audiences of the candidates running for political office right now at the presidential level, and if you ask them the question, do you really believe that racism still exists in America? And many of them would raise their hands. And if you said, well, all of the racists, please stand up, and, and nobody stands up. Well, if we're practicing racism, then who is that? If it's not you, then who? You know people, but you mm -hmm, that, then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the self-declaration of that I'm a practitioner of something that is inappropriate 
where even sometimes, even now though, when you see videos of people going around in the last election with Obama in running, Nancy Pelosi's daughter went out there and did something. They were proudly saying, I'm not voting for him because he's, and they called him a name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of name you wouldn't say on the television if you're trying to be politically correct. But they couldn't care. Mm -hmm. Had a beer in one hand, pot belly out here, <laughs> and he's talking trash, right? <laughs> he could care less because he's out there in the woods where, he, where he's comfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they, that's, that's the way they talk. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I mm -hmm. grew up mm -hmm. in the, the mm -hmm. South. Mm -hmm. So your point is well taken about the leadership. The challenge we have is that that theory has a great challenge in being implemented when you realize that the leadership of a school is one person. There's a, a group of people that help, lead, but there's one decision maker in that school. And that person does not have the ability or even the authority to change the mindsets of the people that they work with. I've, I've said to principals of schools, who are the one we're talking about, the principal of the school. Mm -hmm. School's out there running right now. They don't know what we're doing here. They don't even care. It's the principal of the school and the, and the staff that's in that school. I think principals have the toughest job in America when it comes to managing mm -hmm. a corporation, mm -hmm. small corporation, call business, large business. All the management books that you read talk about what a manager ought to do with his staff and employees. But we assign principals to schools to manage a school with staff that they had no control over. The staff, they didn't pick them, they didn't agree to have them there, and the staff didn't even agree to have the principal come. They just showed up. They said, now, handle it. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the children are pretty much the same, but it's the staff. Mm -hmm. and, and so managing the mindset of staff and their behavior toward children, even if we do the, and I think we should, talk to each other about it, would we talk openly? Would we talk freely, candidly, um, you know, to the point that then we can bring that back? And who do we discuss it with? I think that in many schools, we can identify staff members who have implicit and explicit bias. Mm -hmm. And they could be nice people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they have a bias about mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. whoever those children are. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they don't look like them. That's right. But sometimes they do. They do, yes. So you're not exempt from practicing oppression just because you look like the people you're oppressing. Mm -hmm. We found mm -hmm. that out with police forces and all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Where the guy looks like the people he's, he's oppressing. He's got a blue uniform, mm -hmm. and that blue, for some of them, become the reason why they can mm -hmm. beat up other people because they're expected to do that mm -hmm. for those mm -hmm. who get into that mindset. Mm -hmm. Not condemning police in general, but that kind of stuff. So we're not safe just because they look like us. Mm -hmm. um, and so your, your continued advocacy for us thinking about it mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing you can do. And I hope, as Mr. Zimmer said, I hope you don't stop writing because we do need to keep renewing. It always frustrates me when young folks, they call me old folks, I guess <laughs> I am now. They say, like, I don't know what happened. I said, well, how do you think you got here hmm? if my generation didn't make it easier for you to get here to raise all the heck that you raised and act like you invented this? Mm -hmm. You didn't invent this, right. but you're still suffering <laughs> from right. the conditions that mm -hmm. happened, over, and we haven't gotten rid of it yet. That's right. We can see that right now. You just turn on the TV, and you hear the bloviating. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately for some of them, if you let them talk long enough, they self-incinerate themselves. <laughs> And so you just step back and let them, let them do what they do and just don't say anything. That's my comment. I right. Mean. No, I appreciate it, Dr. McKenna. I, I, I agree, of course, when I said thank you so much for what you've done. But I think you're spot on in terms of yeah, this work is – I'm not, I'm not going to try to minimize how difficult and challenging this work is for school leaders. I was with a group of about 40 principals uh, just Saturday night and, and, and talking about how it's important for, for leaders to identify other school leaders in their building, and school leaders can still be – faculty members, school leaders can be staff members, and how you have to develop that core group of folks who share that vision who can help move the work forward. It's not easy, uh, but I, I tend to think that we're at, a, we're at a point in time where, given all the political craziness around us, that I think <coughs> folks are, are sensing that we've got to find ways to act, perhaps in ways that we've not acted before. And I want to believe, and call me, you know, naively optimistic, I want to believe that, that, that many of, most of our folks in classrooms and in schools want to see what's right on behalf of all children. Uh, I just think we've got to be willing to provide the impetus to help move them in ways that perhaps some may not be comfortable with. But like I've always said to principals when I speak to them, 
yes, doing this work, is it going to cause some discomfort? Yes. Uh, but I don't, I, look, I'm not one who's about political correctness. I could care less about principals and teachers being uncomfortable for two, three hours because some of our babies are uncomfortable in their schools every single day for 180 days out of the school year. So if a little bit of discomfort moves you to a point of doing something different, um, I'll take that exchange any day of the week. Any other uh, comments, questions? This has been just really invigorating and food for thought, and we will move. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank you. that. Thank you. Thank you.